of God we read this morning is found in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We'll read the first 16 verses. And I ask you to pay attention to verses 13 through 16 especially. I won't reread those verses, but those verses constitute the text that we consider this morning. Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. Without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should, after receive for an inheritance, obey. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. Now the text. These all died in faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Thus far we read the word of God this morning. May God bless the reading of his word. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we begin the year of our Lord 2015, it is good for us to be reminded of that common saying that we as Christians are in the world, but we are not of the world. Or to use the language of the text we have before us this morning, we are on the earth, but we are not of the earth. We are but strangers and pilgrims. Our citizenship ultimately, ultimately is not here on this earth. Our allegiance is not to this life or to this world. We do not seek this life or this earth, but are strangers and pilgrims who recognize that we are only temporary residents here and that we are only passing through to another country. 
And it's good for us on this day, the beginning of a new year, when many, and maybe many including us, are making goals for the new year. To remember that our goals must not be merely earthly goals. That when we set our expectations for the new year, those expectations must not be merely earthly expectations. For we are only strangers and pilgrims here. Here is not our home. Our citizenship, as the text explains, is in another city. It is an heavenly city. And our priority is that city. Our priority is to seek that heavenly city. That's where our hearts and our minds and our goals and our expectations need to be. Our goal for 2015 should start here. That doesn't mean that we may not have any other goals or any other expectations for the new year. We may have them, but remembering that we are strangers and pilgrims here and that we have a better country and a better city that we look for, that reminds us that our priority is that city. Remember, this is your calling to be a pilgrim and a stranger on the earth. But remember that this is also your hope and your comfort. Because if you, like Abraham and the other patriarchs, make this confession that this is not your home, you're only here temporarily, that you have a better city for which you look, then you have comfort. And you are able to say that you are on your way to heaven. So I call your attention to this important calling and hope that we have at the beginning of the new year under the theme, Strangers and Pilgrims on the Earth. And we'll ask three questions this morning. Strangers and Pilgrims, where in the first place? Strangers and Pilgrims, how in the second place? And Strangers and Pilgrims, with what hope in the third place? Strangers and Pilgrims on the Earth, where, how, and with what hope? In verse 13 of this text, we have the confession of Abraham and of Isaac and Jacob and Sarah too. She's included here in the context that they didn't really belong on the earth. Where were they strangers and pilgrims? Here, in this earth, in this present world and life. They said, we are strangers here, that is, foreigners. This is not our homeland. And the people here are not our native people. They were, of course, looking around the land of Canaan and around the whole earth. They were saying this of themselves. This is not our country. The people don't speak our language. The customs and the habits here are not our customs and habits. We're strangers. And we are sojourners. That is, we're travelers. We didn't come here to make this our permanent dwelling place. We didn't come here to put down roots. We didn't come here to establish homes that have cement foundations. We came here to live in tents as a picture that we know that we are only here for but a short time and then we're moving on to another place. And the text calls our attention to the fact that this was the attitude of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to the land of Canaan and to the whole earth. We know, and that's described for us here in the context, that Abraham did not view the land of Canaan, the promised land, as his eternal dwelling place. We know that he and his sons lived in that land as foreigners. They did not mix with the Canaanites. They did not say to the Canaanites, we've moved in to become like you. They kept themselves separate from the Canaanites. And 
there was something natural about that. Abraham was a Hebrew. And the Canaanites were Canaanites. They were of different nationalities. Abraham spoke a different language. He probably dressed in a different way. He behaved in a way that was different from the way that the Canaanites behaved. But the difference between Abraham and the Canaanites was not only natural, it was deliberate. Abraham moved into the land of Canaan with the attitude saying, this is not going to be my country. This is not going to be my homeland. This is not where I am going to pin my hopes for a permanent dwelling place. This is not my land. And you, Abraham said, of the Canaanites, are not my people. But the text points out that that was Abraham's attitude not only to the land of Canaan, but to the whole earth. When in verse 15, the text points to the country from whence he came, where he was called out by God. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out. That's a reference to Ur of the Chaldees, the natural homeland of Abraham. That's the place where Abraham knew the language. That's the place where Abraham knew the customs. That's the place where from a natural point of view, Abraham would have fit in and said, this is where I feel at home. If Abraham only desired a place on the earth to call home, then the natural thing for him to do would have been to have returned to Ur of the Chaldees. But the Scriptures teach us that Abraham was called out of that land at the age of 75. He lived to the age of 175, meaning that he did have opportunity for 100 years if if he set his heart upon the earth and said, I want a permanent home in the earth to go back to Ur of the Chaldees. But Abraham made the confession, this earth is not my home. And so Abraham deliberately lived as a pilgrim and stranger in the land of Canaan. But understand that when the text says that this was his confession, that the text is pointing out then that it's not merely that the Canaanites rejected Abraham and said to Abraham, we're going to hold you at arm's length because you're different and we can see that you are different. That often happens. That often happens even for us today. When we as the people of God make a good confession in the midst of the world, live according to that confession, according to God's word, in holiness, then the people of the world recognize that we are different. They see the light of salvation in Jesus Christ shining in us. They don't like that light. They recognize that it's different from the darkness in which they live. And they hold us at arm's length. They say to us, you're different. But the text is pointing out that it's Abraham who made the conscious confession. And Isaac and Jacob to say, we recognize that we're different. We recognize that we are not like you Canaanites. We're not like you people of the world. They recognized that the Canaanites were different, especially in this regard. They made the land of Canaan their home. That is, they made this earth their home. They loved the earth. They wanted to make the earth their permanent dwelling place. They loved the riches and the things and the pleasures of the earth. And they lived for those things and worshipped them. Abraham rejected that. This will not be my home. And you will not be my people. Abraham was spiritually different from the Canaanites. From a natural point of view, he really wasn't different. Oh, we might say he spoke a different language and maybe he 
dressed in a different way from the people of the land of Canaan. But really, from a natural point of view, he was just like the Canaanites. He was born of the earth, of earthly parents, and he was born of the flesh, and he was sinful by nature, and he loved the things of the world by nature. He had a, a natural attraction to the things of the world. He liked the things of the earth, its pleasures and its riches, just like the Canaanites. But Hebrews 11 teaches us, God gave to Abraham faith. God made Abraham a spiritual stranger and pilgrim in the world by giving him faith. And that's the significance of the call of God to Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. That was God's call of Abraham out of the world into God's kingdom. And God gave to Abraham faith so that he would know God and that he would know that he had new promises and a new homeland. Spiritual promises of spiritual riches and of a spiritual place in heaven with God. And by faith in Abraham, seeing those promises, that's what the text speaks of, seeing the promise of salvation from sin through Jesus Christ, seeing the promise of eternal life in heaven, said, I will not make this earth my home and these people my people. I'm a stranger and a pilgrim. This is an instance where the New Testament shows us that this Old Testament history is directly applicable to us as the New Testament people of God. This is who God has made you to be by giving you faith. He has made you to be strangers and pilgrims in the world. You're foreigners. You don't belong here. The people don't speak your language spiritually. They don't behave the way that you behave spiritually. And you are sojourners. You recognize by faith that you are just passing through. Now the question is, how can that be true for you and me? that we are not citizens of this earth. How can it be true of you and me who were born of the earth? We can even name the earthly city in which we were born. And most of us can probably even name the earthly hospital in which we were born. Yet, you're not a citizen of this earth. This is true because of the wonder of God's gift of faith and of His gift of salvation. The wonder is that when God takes hold of His people who are indeed by nature citizens of this earth and delivers them from sin, delivers them from their death, and works regeneration in them, new life, and gives them faith, God gives to them, that's to you and me, a new spiritual origin and a new spiritual homeland. Jesus indicates this when in John 3, speaking about regeneration, He speaks to Nicodemus not merely about being born again for a second time, but he speaks of being born from above, that is, from heaven. And that's what happens in regeneration. When God renews life within His people, He gives them life that comes from heaven. And that's the new man that you and I have now. 
Our old man is from the earth and of the earth. But that old man has been put to death through Jesus Christ and God has given to us a new man. And that new man is not from the earth. That new man is from God in heaven. That new man is from the Lord Jesus Christ who has ascended into heaven. That new man. And we can say this of ourselves. Even as we live here on this earth. I'm not really from here. I came from heaven. I came from God. That's probably the reason... The second reason why in the text we read of the earthly homeland, Ur of the Chaldees, from which Abraham came in verse 15. You see, the full meaning of the word pilgrim is not merely a traveler, one who has traveled to a foreign or to a strange country. But it refers to someone who started his journey from home. He has a homeland, a place where he feels comfortable and that he considers home. And he's going on a pilgrimage, not to go find a new homeland, but to temporarily explore, travel in another place so that he can return home. And the text wants us to understand that that homeland from which Abraham came and to which he will return is not Ur of the Chaldees. But the wonder of God's salvation of Abraham is that he now has faith in salvation and life that comes from heaven. In a sense, you can say this about all of God's people. They live here upon this earth, but they've come from heaven. And when... Jesus comes again. They have the promise that they will return to heaven. So that's what Abraham experienced in his life. That he was from heaven and that he had the life of heaven that he was able to enjoy while he was on the earth. And that's our experience too as those who have faith in Jesus Christ. We're strangers in the earth because God has made us different. God has given us the life of heaven. God has given us the ability to enjoy the salvation of heaven. Or to put it another way, to taste heaven. That's what we experience on the Lord's Day, isn't it? The rest on Sunday that we enjoy is a foretaste of the rest that shall be ours eternally in heaven. We experience now the forgiveness of sins. We experience now peace with God in our hearts. We experience a foretaste of the peace that will reign in the kingdom of heaven as we live in peace and fellowship in the church. And the point is that when we begin to taste salvation, for the gospel of Jesus Christ, we lose our taste for the earth and the things of the earth. And we begin to say, these are not the good things. These are not the things that I truly treasure. These are not the things that I desire or seek after. Those who have faith because they have life from God in heaven. That's why they say, this is not my home. These are not my people. I'm a stranger and a pilgrim on the earth. That's the confession that must be lived. That must come to expression. When Abraham and Isaac and Jacob confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Those weren't empty words. And that was not an expression only of the way that they felt within their hearts and their minds. 
But that was an explanation of the way that they lived. They lived deliberately as strangers and pilgrims. And we need to ask ourselves this morning, how are we to do that? In this year, in this day, recognizing that we are strangers and pilgrims on the earth, how are we to show that in the way that we live? And perhaps I can begin to explain that by using an analogy and comparing our position in the world as pilgrims and strangers to certain kinds of immigrants that come to the United States of America. You know, there are really two kinds of immigrants. There's the one immigrant who leaves his homeland and comes to the United States of America and he wants to fit in. He's ready to forget about his old country. He's for, ready to forget about his old language. He's ready to learn English. He's ready to try to fit into America. Sometimes we call that Americanization. This immigrant wants to be Americanized. Whatever it means to be an American, whatever culture, whatever habits, practices he needs to adopt, he's ready to adopt them and become an American. That's the kind of immigrant that those who are already living in America often speak well of. And then there's that other kind of immigrant that many people complain about. He's the immigrant who comes from the old country, but he doesn't want to let it go. He doesn't want to forget about the old country, the old language, the old customs and habits. He's not interested in becoming Americanized. In fact, he may even be offended and turned off by American culture and society. He wants to maintain the old ways. And that is probably the kind of immigrant that is usually complained about. Well, people of God, from a spiritual point of view, the Word of God calls us to be like that second immigrant. The Word of God says to you and me that we are to live here in this country, but from a spiritual point of view now, we are not to be Americanized. Oh, we may speak English and we may adopt some of the harmless customs and behaviors of the people of this land. But the Word of God is teaching you and me this morning that we are spiritual strangers and pilgrims in this land. And from a spiritual point of view, we are to be different. This world's language, this world's behavior and practices may not be ours from a spiritual point of view. But now remember, this isn't simply our calling, but this is our desire. That's what the text sets before us here. This was the confession of Abraham and Sarah and their children and grandchildren. And this is our confession too. We say with our own hearts and our own minds, we're different. Don't want to be like the Canaanites or the people of the world. Why would we want to be like them? They don't have life from heaven. They don't know God. They don't live for God. They don't experience the joy of salvation. They live, the scriptures teach us, like carnal beasts. And if you have faith, you see that. Abraham, looking on the people in the land of Canaan, saw these are people who love sin. These are people who devote themselves to sin. These are people who are enemies of God. I want to be nothing like them. That's what we need to say. In 2015, as strangers and pilgrims, we don't want to be anything like the people of the world who live in sin. And understand, we say that not because we lift ourselves up in pride, because we think that we're any better than them by nature, 
but because God has given to us the life of heaven and so that we experience the joy and the beauty of heaven and we can look at the things of this earth and the way people live in the world and we see the emptiness of it all. Their lives are spiritually empty. Therefore, in 2015, we must live as strangers and pilgrims avoiding sin. But the text makes this very broad. It's not only that we seek to live differently by not living in sin and seeking the pleasures of sin, but when the text says we live as strangers and pilgrims on the earth, it means that our whole attitude to the earth and everything in the earth is different from the people of the world. Now here, we have to consider our attitude towards the things of this earth that in themselves are good and are not sinful. There's nothing wrong with food and drink. There's nothing wrong with having an earthly job or even enjoying earthly success in that earthly job. There's nothing wrong with money in itself. There's nothing wrong with many of the riches and the pleasures of the world. But as we look at the Canaanites of the world, we need to see their attitude towards these things is completely different from what our attitude must be. They love. They live for. They seek after only those things of the world. And we must say, that's not me. That's foreign to me. I don't think that way. These things of the world aren't that important. There's something better. Perhaps here too, an example will help make the point. We need to have a different attitude towards sports than the people of the world do. It's important for us in the church. For example, I'm not going to say this morning that a Christian may not follow any of the teams or the sports of the world in a moderate fashion. Yet we must keep in mind that their dedication, their drive, their focus, their worship even of the activity that they are in may not characterize us at all. I think of an active NBA player who's in his later years of his career who now that he is older and he has been a superstar now that he is older, has to dedicate himself even more than he ever has to his sport. He has to exercise strenuously. He has to follow a very strict diet and live what many people would consider a very difficult life, all so that he can perform on the basketball court. And the thing that particularly struck me was that he said, it's worth it. It's worth it to him. It's worth it to him to devote his whole life to basketball. Now we as Christians, by faith, need to say, no, it's not. That's not worth it. Not worth it to pursue sports or the things of this world. For all of one's zeal and activity not worth it to seek after money, to seek after fame, power in the world. I have a different life, a better life. I have a living soul, a saved soul, and I will seek after spiritual things rather than the things of this world. And that's the positive. The negative is that as strangers and pilgrims in this world, we will not pursue sin. We will not set our 
hearts upon the things of this world, but we will seek after God. The world sees our calling as merely negative. The world says you Christians are negative. There's many things you cannot do when you make yourselves strangers and pilgrims in the world. But we need to be able to respond with there's the positive, there's the life of faith and the life with God that is so worth it. When we say negatively, we are not of the earth, we can say, and must say positively, we are of heaven. Heaven is the place where we came from. And heaven is our home. And so, we say, we've given up sin. We've given up the pleasures of the world. But that's so that we can enjoy citizenship in the kingdom of God. That's so that we can enjoy life with God as God's people living here in the midst of of this world. This is what we say to the people of the world. We are different. and You don't understand us. We would give up sin and the riches of this world to enjoy fellowship with God any day. Because we're His people. But the text offers more than that. When God says that you are to live as pilgrims and strangers in the world, we hear that means we keep ourselves separate from the world. But understand, God does not mean that this, does not say here this means you must live alone. No, it comes out even in the chapter, doesn't it? We have fellow strangers and pilgrims who are traveling through this world with us. Abraham dwelled together, together with Isaac and Jacob in tents. Beloved, you and I have the opportunity to dwell together with those who have the same life from heaven, the same faith, the same salvation, and the same hope. The Word of God is live as a stranger and pilgrim by separating yourself from the world. Don't seek fellowship and friendship with the Canaanites, with the unbelievers. Seek fellowship and friendship with your fellow pilgrims. Young people, there are your friends. There are the people you date. There are the people you marry. There are the people you worship with. There are the people you have friendship and fellowship with. And so, in the year 2015, live as pilgrims and strangers in that way. Don't content yourselves with merely changing some earthly habits or making some earthly goal. Do this. Turn your mind and your heart from sin, from the things of this world, and seek to serve God according to His Word. Here's your pilgrim's manual. Here's how you enjoy life and fellowship with God as His people on the earth. And if you do that, if you live as a pilgrim and stranger, you will enjoy rich friendship and fellowship with your fellow pilgrims and strangers, and you'll have hope all your life and die in hope. Abraham, the text tells us, died in faith. What a beautiful thing. Not having received the promises. That is, God promised him the land of Canaan. But he didn't receive in his lifetime the land of Canaan as his land. And God promised him also Christ. That he would come as his seed. Christ did not come during his lifetime. But he saw the promise. He believed. He believed. Christ is going to come. My sins will be forgiven. I will live in heaven. I will receive the resurrection of the body. What an important thing to die in faith. It's important because everyone does die. 
And that means that from a certain point of view, everyone is a stranger and pilgrim on the earth. We know, don't we, that there are many who won't want to reckon with that reality. Many who deny this truth that they are pilgrims and strangers on the earth. They don't see that they're only passing through this life and only here temporarily. They want to make their home here in this world. They want to live here forever. And those who refuse to be strangers and pilgrims in this world, they will die. And when they do, they'll lose everything. Their homes that have foundations, their money, all their possessions, and worst of all, their souls in eternal death in hell. Those who live as pilgrims and die in faith have the hope of heaven. And they declare this plainly by the way that they live. People don't have to ask you. Because if they see how you live, they'll have the answer to the question, why? Why do you serve God? Why do you forsake sin? Why do you not seek after the things of this world and the riches of this world? Why do you love God's Word? Why do you diligently study it? Why do you insist on being in church twice on the Lord's Day? Why do you support Christian schools? Why do you make many spiritual sacrifices in your life? Why is it that the world isn't that important to you? God and the church are everything to you. When you live that way, you make a confession. You don't even have to speak. You say, I'm a pilgrim and I'm a stranger. My home is heaven. I seek a better country. Take that to heart, people of God. This text says heaven is a better country. Better than this earth. Better than anything this world has to offer. It is a better country. Or literally, fatherland. That's the word in the text. It's the home of God who is our Father. It is the place where God lives with His people in eternal covenant fellowship. It's the place where Jesus Christ lives with His people, revealing to them the full glory of God. It's the place where there's no more sin or death or sorrow. And it's the place that by faith we see, we know it's real. And this is our hope that we will live in heaven. We experience it now, the life of heaven. And so real enriches the experience of the life of heaven now that we know, don't we? We could never be content here. We could never be happy in this world, no matter how much God gave us in this life. We long for heaven, to be with Him in the sinless existence of eternal glory. We want Christ. Those who have no faith have no interest in God or in heaven. They don't care about sin. We seek a better country. The glory of heaven by faith. And when we arrive there, then our status as strangers and pilgrims will come to an end. Then I will say, and you will say, I belong here. This is my home. This is where I am comfortable. I'm not moving on. I'm going to live here forever and ever. Beloved, in this year 2015, remember this confession. That you're a stranger and a pilgrim. You're not home here. Your home is heaven. Amen. Father in heaven, 
How we love to call Thee our Father in heaven. It reminds us that we are Thine. reminds us that our sins have been forgiven. That we have been adopted to be Thy children and heirs in Jesus Christ. And we love to call Thee our Father in heaven because it reminds us too that Thou art living in heaven as Thy dwelling place in that one day it will be our home too. Until then, give us faith and preserve us in our faith that we may not only call ourselves pilgrims and strangers, but that we may also live as pilgrims and strangers in the midst of this world. Forgive us all of our sins and preserve us for Jesus' sake. Amen.